beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Testimonies before kings, O Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Come, O children, listen to me. The Lord redeems the life of his servants.
and grant to your church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from the one who is, and who was, and who is to come. Here is the truth. Man is enslaved to sin and all the consequences of that sin. He cannot help sinning because it is endemic to his nature. Therefore, all of the suffering and guilt, all of the judgment and shame, all the destruction and brokenness that sin spawns are his fault and no other. This is the first part of Jesus' sermon in our gospel reading this morning. The tentacles of evil corruption find every possible crevice to creep into life on this earth and grab hold of us. We need to be freed from this many-armed parasite, but freedom comes at a cost. On the eve of All Hallows, October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther, son of a copper miner, ex-law student, current Roman Catholic monk of the Augustinian Order of Hermits at the, and professor of theology at the new Wittenberg University, nailed to the door of the castle church his 95 theses asking for a debate on the abuse of the sale of indulgences by the universal church. We usually preach about this iconic event as the spark that finally ignited the smoldering kindling of the reformation of the church. Now, it's not Reformation Day unless we use a couple of cool German words that speak to the struggles that Luther had gnawing on his heart. And they apply to us more and more each day, so they remain relevant. The first is zeitgeist, literally time spirit, the spirit of the age, the trend of thought and feeling during a period. The zeitgeist of every age hates objective truth. And God's word is the most objective truth of all. Additionally, the zeitgeist of Luther's time told him and all believers that God was an angry judge out to punish him for his sins unless he did something about it. Also in Martin's time, the zeitgeist was to let the Bible take a back seat to the doctrines of man. The church added to it, making up all sorts of make-believe to try to help soothe their consciences. Things like indulgences, private masses for the dead, penance, prayers to dead and deaf saints. For example, if one were to venerate all of the sacred relics displayed behind that door he nailed the theses on in the castle church, you would earn over 1.9 million years off of purgatory. Now, maybe all of this began with good intentions, but like all things paving the road to hell, there are dire consequences. Places like purgatory were invented. Would you find it motivating not to sin, knowing that you would have to work for millions of years to pay for unabsolved sins in this life before you could go to heaven? Or would you simply kick that can down the road and worry about it when you got there? practice of indulgences, not surprisingly, was begun during another dark period in the history of the church, the Crusades. The first known use of plenary indulgences was in the year 1095, when Pope Urban II remitted the penance of all those who confessed their sins and participated in the Crusades. And then in the early 1200s, they began to be sold to promote the church and her mission. In other words, fundraising. Now, plenary indulgence erases all of an individual's sins, allowing him to go directly to heaven without a term of indenture in purgatory. And to this day, you can earn a plenary indulgence by watching a newly elected pope wave to you from the balcony of the Apostolic Palace. Now, if only all of these misguided popes, priests, believed the words of the Bible instead, if only those evil church leaders had taken God's law seriously and repented of their crimes. Monks like Martin prayed the Psalms seven times a day. And all the priests were supposed to do likewise. They would go through the entire book of Psalms in a week. And in those prayers, 
And that is what the Psalms are, are God's truth. In them, we see the tears of a people terrified of a wrathful God, but also the assurance that God is merciful and just, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love to those who fear him and repent of their sins. Reading the words of Christ, they would have seen Jesus condemning the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and seen in that mirror of the law that they were doing the exact same thing. They were adding to God's word, treating as scripture the doctrines of man. And the spirit of this current age is far worse. It tells us that God's word is really just the corrupted words of men. And the truth is whatever you want it to be anyway, so why worry? Now the Reformation began not because Luther thought indulgences were the killers of souls, which they were and are to this day, but rather that in the torment of his own soul and heart, he found grace and solace in his reading, in his study, and in his lectures on the Psalms as well as the commentary of church fathers like St. Augustine, to whose order he belonged, and who wrote many great works before the church fell into such gross idolatry and sin that necessitated this whole reformation in the first place. It was in God's word that Martin finally discovered not the angry judge out to punish his sins in hell, but the righteous God, who died on the cross to impute that righteousness to him by faith alone. As Paul wrote to the Galatians, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm therefore and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And again to the Ephesians, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Now Luther didn't get there right away. The Zeitgeist, led to our next cool German word, Anfechtung. Martin Luther talked about his Anfechtung a great deal because it affected him most severely. The zeitgeist leads us to our own Anfechtungen, though we might not recognize it. Instead, we might only feel what the Germans called Lebensmüde, life weariness. Never felt that. Or Weltschmerz, that background nagging dissatisfaction and pain when life fails to meet our expectations. But on factum, Luther would say, means temptation and trial and affliction and tribulation all rolled into one. Another way of thinking about on factum is because of sin, because of the devil's temptations, because of the world's influence, that zeitgeist listening to it, you are a slave. And all people need to be set free from spiritual slavery. Jesus' listeners didn't understand it. They didn't think they had ever been slaves. They forgot about that whole thing in Egypt. Now listen to what Jesus says to the contrary. Therefore I said to you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin, and only Christ can set spiritual slaves free. Jesus' audience didn't believe they were slaves to sin. Therefore, they were enslaved by unbelief. At first, Luther didn't understand either. Luther felt trapped on all sides. He saw the devil everywhere. He made himself physically ill chasing down every last sin he could so he could confess it, only to uncover more sins. And in his despair, that anfectung was eating away at his soul, and no amount of Hail Marys and scrubbing floors could make his trials easier. In fact, he shortened his life because of the way he treated his body. Now imagine your own guilt Imagine you awoke throughout the night to pray and worked your fingers to the bone so that you could feel God's love, only to feel ever more filthy from sin. And don't we sometimes feel like that? Don't we come to church to confess our sins, only to go home and think, God couldn't have possibly forgiven me. I'm not worthy. Well, you're not. 
not. I'm not. Luther wasn't. Do you feel the unfecto? Luther thought it was the fact that he was sinful that was causing his slavery. So he could never be free. The truth is no one, Christian or non-Christian, ever can. We remain sinful. Does that mean Christ has not set us free? Luther thought his bondage was caused by his sins, but it was really something else. His slavery was induced by the fact that he couldn't hear the voice of Jesus and believe in him. Because as a monk, as a priest, he didn't hear the words of Jesus. Imagine how unbearable that had to be. Now today, that same dubious disposition is happening to us. The world, for the most part, doesn't admit that it is enslaved. The vast majority of people, even those who claim to be spiritual, believe in sin about as much as they believe that teaching what really happened in history might prevent the next generation from re repeating the mistakes of the past. Yet we Christians, God's own children, can find ourselves living and acting as though we are still in chains. We do not behave as one God has set free to be for God, for our neighbor, what he has set us free to be to them. So what is the deal? What is this slavery then? Have we forgotten the lessons of the Reformation? It's a slavery of the ears. It's caused by listening, listening to the wrong voices, listening to false messages, listening to the zeitgeist, and then succumbing to our infectum. The Jews in Jesus' day were listening to a lot of fabricated traditions, but they certainly were not listening to Jesus' words. They heard them, but they refused to understand fully. If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, Jesus said, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. These particular Jews, John tells us, already believed in Jesus, but their ears were stopped up to the full truth. They thought he was speaking of physical chains, like when their ancestors were prisoners in Egypt, not the bondage of a soul in chains for eternity. Who was Luther listening to? For many years, he was listening to the screaming of his own innermost fears, his inmost voice, the one we too sometimes hear whispering to us, you're not worthy of God's love. Who do you think you are? That voice is asking the wrong question. The question is, who is Jesus? Jesus answers, I am the light of the world. Before Abraham was born, I am. If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. I am the true vine, cut down on Calvary for you to be free. He says to you, listen, this is who I am. This is what I have done. Be at peace. Be set free from your sins and your unbelief. Listen to the voice of Jesus and be set free. God enabled Luther to open his ears to the voice of Jesus, which overcame the accusations of his conscience. Listen to Jesus' voice and be set free from the slavery of sin. Jesus says, yes, your sin is very great, but I am the perfect son of God. I am greater than your sin. You will not die in your sins. I died for them already. You belong to me. Jesus says you've been listening to the zeitgeist that says you're in control. Stop it. It's leading you back into chains. Go home in peace today, knowing that no matter how wicked this world becomes, the church invisible, the true institution of true believers will remain standing. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, which we read is justified lest the righteous stretch out their hands to do wrong. Says Psalm 125, talking about as bad as it looks like it's going to get out there, take heart, it's not going to get so bad that there are no believers left. Then take home these words of St. Augustine. Oh, that I might repose on thee, 
Oh, that thou wouldst enter into my heart and inebriate it, that I may forget my ills and embrace thee, my soul good. Listen to Martin Luther. He is not righteous who does much, but he who without work believes much in Christ. The law says, do this, and it is never done. Grace says, believe in this, and everything, everything is already done for you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now may the peace which passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with John Huss, Julio Savadavola, William Tyndale, Martin Luther, Philip Melanchthon, Martin Chemnitz, and all the great performers of blessed memory, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
Thanks to Almighty God that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you, men of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you, and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, one God.